Hello everyone and welcome to the second webinar for Computer Network Fundamentals, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward and I'll be your MC. Your mentor is Matt Constable. Before we begin, as usual, I have a few words for those new to Zoom's webinar functions. We encourage the asking of questions and the use of chat during the webinar and there are two ways to do so that we use. We ask that you direct all course content related questions to the question and answer section or the Q&A section and that you send all administration types questions to the support team in chat and those icons are at the bottom of your Zoom window. You can chat with panellists only or to all of your fellow students as well and you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you have opened the chat log. As I said last week, there are usually some very experienced industry based attendees and, and they're most helpful with any queries that people throw out there and any and often have a great insight into into a problem that Matt won't be touching on during his webinars. So make use of them. Uh, we'll have Q&A sessions periodically and if the questions are particularly relevant, uh, we'll interrupt Matt midstream. Chantel is again around tonight in an administrative and technical support role for IT Masters. Um, they are also responsible for the learn.itmasters.edu.au website, which is where you'll find the other materials needed for this course. Readings, discussion forums, quizzes and, and lab information and, and help. If you have any questions tonight or later on, uh, please feel free to contact us using the details on that page or you can put something in the discussion forum. And that's enough out of me for tonight. Uh, here is Matt. Thank you, Guy, as ever, for your uh, wonderful introduction. Um, welcome back, everyone, after last week's long session. Um, tonight will be uh, quite a bit shorter. I'm sure you'll be pleased to hear. Uh, and we'll be talking uh, about um, infrastructure topics. So basically looking at uh, these, are, these are some of the key details uh, that you will uh, learn through the different um, resources that you have at your disposal for this week. And specifically this evening, we're going to be talking about some WAN essential topics, so some essential theories and ideas that you need to understand to really get a good grip on what a wide area network is, which we touched on briefly last week in terms of the basic explanation for what a wide area network is, and we'll look at that more. We're going to talk a little bit about virtualization principles, more specifically how they relate to the network component of virtualization rather than talking about virtual machines and, and that sort of software. So it's a little bit, it's quite streamlined. It's a little bit uh, different tack to what you'd normally see in discussions about virtualization. And then lastly, uh, we'll look at some VPN principles as well. So without further ado, let's hop into the WAN essentials. So as we spoke about last week, a WAN or a wide area network is really a network that is going to traverse some considerable distance. Um, and it connects it connects local area lands uh, local area networks together. So, you, if you're a um, a particular company that may have three or four uh, offices and a head office, they could be dispersed anywhere across your state or country. Um, and there needs to be some. Usually, there's some way of inter interconnecting or some requirement to interconnect those particular local area networks. And to do that, we use this WAN wide area network technologies. The actual methods that we use to transmit information are varied and we'll look at some of those uh, as we go along this evening. And it really depends on your business needs which one of those wide area network technologies you are going to use because there's a, a wide variety in how they can be connected together, how your sites can be connected together uh, and the performance that you get over your WAN will be all dependent on how much money you have to spend on the particular technology. In terms of if we compare WAN and LAN um, to each other, they have a number of common properties, one of which is that they are there to uh, share resources between clients and hosts. And that will become evident when we look at the topologies as well. So uh, you'll see that there's some similarity between the WAN topologies and the LAN topologies as well. It's just that the underlying technology used to build them is different. Uh, they will they use layer three and higher protocols as we spoke about last week in the OSI model. So they use the same uh, IP addressing schemes and the same routing protocols that you would use inside a LAN. 
Uh, there are some differences at, at layer one and layer two, but layer three um, is pretty much the same across LAN and WAN. And they use some packet switch digitized data. So in other words, we basically switch at that layer two uh, level of the OSI model. So like a, a, a LAN switch, switches at layer two based on MAC address, there are similar addressing mechanisms at layer two for WAN as well. So there's still a packet switch technology. If you look at the differences, the main differences really are the layer one and two access methods. So how uh, the information gets transmitted across a WAN and how it's encoded across a WAN is very different uh, to a LAN. The topologies are a little different in terms of the implementation, but the overall idea is pretty much the same. And the media, and by that we mean the type of cabling that's used between sites is, is different um, be, simply because, you know, if you had a, um, say, a, a twisted pair cable, it is not going to go over the same geographical uh, distances as what a um, fibre optic cable or a microwave link, for example, will use. And we'll have a look at that shortly. LAN, so LAN stands for local area network. So we had a look at that uh, last week. Um, so local area network wiring is generally privately owned. So it's generally something that you would get installed within your uh, service location, or enterprise location. And it's something that you would generally maintain yourself or be responsible. Uh, you may outsource it, get uh, contractors in to maintain it, but you would be responsible for the actual cabling itself. Whereas in the WAN, the wiring and the underlying carriage architecture is generally provided through a network service provider, or in Australia, we usually call them internet service providers, so an ISP. Uh, some examples of those, there, there's some American ones, AT&T, Verizon and Sprint. Over here, we would have, you know, Optus, Telstra, um, smaller places like uh, Benio Community Telco or Community Telco Australia. Um, AAPT is an example of another service provider as well. So there's a, there, there's a heap of different ones that are available in Australia and which one you go to is going to depend on their connection in your particular area that you're wanting a WAN link and obviously price. So WAN site uh, is generally an individual geographic location, locations, locational locations connected by uh, WANs. A WAN link is simply a WAN site to WAN site connection. So anything that connects two uh, offices, two of your offices or hubs together, that's a WAN link. Okay, a WAN site is just either end of that WAN link. So a WAN site and a LAN, LAN site, are basically the same, one and the same thing for the purposes of a WAN, what we're discussing here. Um, in terms of the differences in the topologies, the overall look and feel of the topology is really similar. Uh, distance covered, number of users and traffic are the three considerable distances, uh, di differences. So distance covered, interstate, uh, in between, um, towns or in between countries, so global networks. Number of users, obviously, as you add more connections to your WAN, more sites to your WAN, the number of users increases quite dramatically. And the traffic. Now, by that, we mean the speed, a couple of things. The amount of the traffic is generally less across a WAN link than it is across a LAN simply because we don't want to have to provision huge bandwidth uh, links on our WAN in order to, in order to uh, transmit massive amounts of data, okay? They're generally used for transmitting uh, really uh, mission critical or business critical information uh, between sites. So you'd still have at each of your local sites, if your local area network sites, you're going to have your servers and your workstations and all your you know, printing devices and everything else, your virtualization platforms and all that, which are still relevant specifically to those sites. The WAN is more about shared resources, okay? And again, um, that can be in different ways, which we'll, we'll see when we get to the example pages. WAN connections, uh, you have to have layer three devices. So that is, you have to have routers to connect your WAN, okay? You can't just use switches. Um, you can't use firewalls. You can't use load balancers. You really need um, layer three devices, specifically routers. And 
this is a bit of a moot point. Generally, genuine, generally, you cannot carry non ratable protocols. So that is layer two protocols or LAN broadcast protocols. You cannot carry them across WAN connections. There is an exception to that, um, which is uh, when we use MPLS technology, which is multi protocol label switching technology, but that's uh, a little bit left of center and uh, not one of the not one of the technologies that we look at in any detail during this short course. So that's an example of a first of all, we have a land topology on the left. So we have our router which connects off to the internet, we have our file and web servers, we have our switch which then connects to a number of clients here. So that's uh, no different to what we looked at uh, last week. Basically a star topology, uh, a single central switch in the middle which everything branches off. On the right here, we have a really basic schematic of a WAN diagram. So you can see here, we've got geographical locations. So Miami, New York, Detroit, San Fran, and Houston are all connected. Now, this is an interesting topology in that it's a, it's a star, partially a star in that it's connected, all sites connect off Miami. So you would perhaps assume that that is your head office, but there's also these interconnecting links between San Fran, Detroit, New York, um, to use as redundant links. So in that case, it's really a partial mesh topology, which we will explain and I'll explain in more detail as we get to that section very shortly. But uh, as with a LAN, there can be a combination of different topologies forming your WAN. So first topology is a bus topology. And this is just simply where, so it's no different to a bus topology in, land, in, in the land world, where it's simply a topology where each site will connect in a serial formation to other sites. Okay, each site will generally only connect to two sites maximum, because any more than that, and it becomes a star or a different topology. The network site is dependent on every other site to transmit and receive traffic. So every site has to transmit and receive traffic in order to be able to communicate with each other, which in other topologies is not necessarily the case. Different locations are connected to another through point to point links. And I'll explain that more when we get to the next page. It's best used for organizations requiring very small WANs or dedicated circuits. So relatively few sites, doesn't matter the geographical distances, um, doesn't matter. Uh, can be very far away, can be very close, uh, but a small WAN, so few sites, few amount of users, few uh, bandwidth requirements, and usually is used using dedicated circuits. So uh, circuits, in other words, WAN connections that are nailed up constantly, they're always on, always available. The drawback with the bus topology is it's not particularly scalable. And if we have a look at the diagram, we can sort of see, get a little bit of an inkling as to why. So in this diagram here, we have uh, our four sites which are connected serially to each other. Okay, so as we said, each site is only connected to two other sites. And each site must transmit through the other sites in order to be able to communicate to all other sites. So here, for example, Columbus, if it wants to communicate to the Madison office, it has to go through Watertown and the other Madison office in order to get to this South Oak Street uh, office here. Similarly, if Main Street wants to talk to Columbus, it, ha uh, it has to transmit through Watertown. Um, and as you can see that, that all traffic must pass uh, at some stage through all other sites. If you were to think that we were to add you know, another site here and then another site on and another site on, you can see very quickly it becomes, that's why it's not scalable. By the time you add 10, 15, 20 LAN connections in this bus topology, it can take an extraordinary long uh, period of time for traffic to go from one end, so one extreme, so say here at South Oak Street, to Columbus if there is 20 or 30 sites in between them. Okay, every link that it has to transit adds extra delay uh, in that link extra time and you get to a point where it becomes unworkable, the performance is simply not enough. So it's really only useful, as we said before, to few sites um, or with and with dedicated circuits. So the next one is the ring, um, and this is not that dissimilar really to the to the bus, but there's just an extra link, um, which we'll see which joins the two 
end sites or uh, sites at the extreme ends of the bus together to form that ring. So again, in this case, each site is connected to only two other sites. It forms a ring pattern, which we have a look at in the next slide. Um, it connects all locations together. Uh, there is not necessarily the requirement for traffic to transit across all sites in order to get from one end to the other, okay? Because it has multiple, has two ways. It can go left or right in the ring if we look at that. It does rely on uh, redundant rings. So um, because there's a ring topology there, if there is a site failure, data can be rerouted the other way. Expansion is quite difficult and expensive. Uh, and its best use is really connecting a maximum of five sites. Again, for a, uh, a similar reason in that uh, the bigger the ring is, the longer traffic takes to pro propagate. And with the expectations now of speed and bandwidth um, in the contemporary world, uh, ring topologies generally don't cut it. Where you most commonly see rings employed now is in a metropolitan area network fiber backbone. So a really high speed, uh, fiber optic network in the center of a city and then customers and generally owned by a service provider and then customers will interconnect into that high speed fiber ring in order to get between backwards and forwards between their own sites at different locations around the city. So that's an example of the ring there. So as we see, it's very similar to the bus. So you've still got the four sites interconnected with the ex existing links that they had in the previous slide. But here we've got this extra T1 link between uh, Columbus and Oak Street, Madison, which now completes that WAN topology as a ring. Now, in this case, assuming you've got your uh, traffic engineering up to speed and you're clever with the way you use your routing protocols, if um, Columbus here was going to transmit data to the Oak Street, South Oak Street side at Madison, it would go this way rather than go this way, the longer route this way. Um, the, Madison, the main street side at Madison could go either way to get to Columbus um, because it's really the same distance in terms of hop counts. But when we get to routing protocols, we'll talk about the different types of metrics that routing protocols use and you'll indeed learn from that that there actually is in this particular case a faster way for the traffic to go. And so it will it'll choose one branch of the ring over another in order to get to uh, a site uh, more quickly. So the star topology is uh, almost identical in, in high level to the WAN topology. So where we have a uh, land topology, sorry, land, land star. So where we have a switch, which is a center point in a land star, in this case, we simply have a site and WAN links connect off that particular main site to all the other sites. So single site, central connection point, separate data routes between any two sites. Okay, I'll talk about what that means in a minute. The advantages to this are that there's a single connection. Um, if there's a single connection failure, it affects only that connection. Okay, only that location, not every other uh, location. Whereas in the, in the bus and ring topologies, depending on where the failure is, it may actually affect more than one site. So in this case, it doesn't. There are also shorter data paths between any two sites. So shorter data paths in terms of the actual hop count. Okay, and you'll see that in a second. Expansion is quite simple and less costly. The drawback is though, that if the central site fails, it can bring down the entire network. So if we look at that here, this is a star topology. So we have our Main Street Madison uh, site. We have our other Madison site, our Waterton and our Columbus site all connecting back to Madison. Now, this is good in terms of uh, communications between Madison uh, and the main office or Watertown and the main office and Columbus and the main office because they each only have one hop now to get to them. Whereas before Columbus, for example, on the ring and the bus had to go through Waterton to get to Madison there. That's not the case anymore. It can just transmit straight away. In terms of how you would use this, the star topology in a WAN is most useful if most of your shared resources exist at the Main Street Madison site, because that's where most of our resources are, then that's where we would funnel our WAN links in to make that the head office so that everyone gets equal access to those shared resources rather than having to either flow through other sites via a ring or a bus 
to get to that particular site. And you can see, hopefully you can sort of uh, understand that it's quite easy to add an extra site on. So if we have another site over here, say in Flander, we could simply add another WAN link into the star straight to Madison and away we go. So it's not as difficult as it is in the ring um, topology where you have to actually somewhere at some point break the ring to insert a new site. So reroute that ring, which sounds simple when you draw it on a bit of paper. But when you're actually trying to engineer that physically and build cabling and infrastructure to do that, it can be quite complex. Similarly with a bus too, depending on where you insert a site, it can be quite uh, difficult and expensive to do. Whereas in a star topology, really, really simple. We merely provision another WAN service here at Madison and then at the new site, say in Atlanta, and connect them together and you're good to go. The next one is the mesh topology. Um, and this incorporates basically a lots of direct connections between all your sites. And in this case, data will travel directly from the origin, origin site to the destination site. It doesn't have to flow through any other site in order to get there. If, sorry, if I just go back for a second, um, the other thing with the star topology is if um, Columbus needs to talk to Watertown now, it's got to go back through the Madison head office in, our, in order to get to Waterton. Whereas in the mesh topology, it doesn't have to do that. It can transmit directly to Waterton. So routers are really, in this case, more responsible for redirecting the data easily and quickly because every router at every site has a link to every other site in the WAN. A little bit more complex in terms of local site connectivity but and in terms of routing, but better user experience. Um, because there are so many links involved, it is the most fault tolerant WAN type. So if a link goes down, uh, you know, you lose, you might lose connection to one site um, for a short period of time, but then once your routing gets up and running again uh, and things get back up to speed, you will be able to reach that site through other potential links. Um, unless of course a whole site goes down, in which case it's only that site that's off the air and everything else is still able to continue. With a full mesh WAN, every WAN site is directly connected to every other site, as we said. The big drawback with that simply is cost. It costs a lot to provision all of these links. Um, there is a partial mesh WAN as well, which is less costly. Um, and this is where you, you basically provide uh, direct links between all the really more important sites. And if you have less important sites or lesser priority sites, you can have them just connected in simply. And here's an example of this now. So if we look at our full mesh, you can see uh, every site has, and we've got some new sites here, we've got every site has a link to every other site. So that's great. So if this T3, uh, or if this DSL, we'll use the DSL, if the DSL goes down between Detroit and Indianapolis, it is possible that Indianapolis can still reach the Detroit site by going back through Madison. Okay, so that's the advantage of a full mesh because every site is linked to every other site. There's that redundancy and a lot of links have to drop out or a whole site has to drop out before there are significant issues in terms of connectivity. But as we said, that is really, really expensive and complex. So complex to manage, complex to um, implement uh, and complex if you need to make any changes. Uh, just because it, the, the potential for affecting a lot of other sites uh, is brought into, in, into play. With a partial mess like we see here, we can see that uh, these three sites are linked to each other. They're all, they've all got links to each other. So that's almost like, as you can see, a partial mesh in this case is almost like a ring with a star, a star leg here. Okay, so if you consider this site to be the star, and these guys to be in a ring, it's a combination really of a couple of topologies. Um, so in this case, Indianapolis has uh, been determined to be the less important site or the uh, lower priority site. And so it just gets a link to this site here, whereas these guys are all talking to each other. So same thing again, there's some redundancy. Okay, a tiered topology is basically where we have sites connected in, basically we use multiple uh, topologies to connect all sites together. And this is often done um, in terms of uh, for, for cost and flexibility in your growth.
and we'll see probably the best way to explain it is just skip to the diagram here. So we've got our three main sites, if you like, so our bigger sites, Madison, Detroit, New York. And then we've got other smaller sites which connect to these larger sites. Now, you can see, hopefully, that all sites can still, if, if all links in the network are up, all sites can still speak to each other. But some sites, so Toronto to talk to Toledo, has to go through Detroit, for example. They can't talk to each other directly. Uh, New York can talk to Detroit uh, directly, but if it needs to get to Madison, it has to go through Detroit. So there's some trade-offs. Okay, So there's some advantages to it in that there's a little less complexity, a little less cost, but the, the trade-off is that you know, there's some extra latency involved because there's multi-hop links and, and you have to go through other sites in order to talk to all sites. The other thing with this is, of course, if this T3 link here, say, between Detroit and Madison was to go down, then these all these three sites here would be isolated from the rest of the WAN. So while they would be able to talk to each other still, sure, they wouldn't be able to talk to anywhere else. Now, if Detroit, if Detroit was to go down, that would be worst case scenario because then you'd end up with Toronto and Toledo down because they couldn't get they, – they, would be isolated if, if the whole Detroit office was off there. Uh, these, these three offices here would be isolated and these three offices there would be isolated. So you can see the redundancy isn't as good as in a mesh or a partial mesh, but you know, there's those trade-offs that you have to, um, have to decide which way you want to go. So you can mix all of these topologies together. Um, and you can use any combination of them to create your overall WAN architecture and which way you go is going to depend on your performance requirements, uh, your cost profile, so how much money you've got to spend on it, and more importantly, the services that are going to be available to you in each area. If you don't have certain, if you don't have T3s or T1s or different sort of services in Australia, but if you don't have those high speed links, um, available to you in these particular areas, then you're going to have to fudge around and work out how you're going to provide this connectivity over slower links or use potentially use a different topology, which is better suited to slow speed links. So there's quite a lot of questions to answer and with any, and here it is, I knew it would come out sooner or later, my old chestnut where I always say um, the, the answer to 99.99% of design questions is it depends. So if you're going to ask me now which topology is best or which type of service is best, uh, it depends. Depends on what service you're trying to guarantee your users, how much information you're going to be sending across the WAN, what services are available, how much money you've got, what sort of routing equipment you've got. The list is pretty endless. So it's almost impossible to give you a straight answer without a whole heap of uh, different variables. Alrighty, but uh, maybe we can whip through the questions that we have now and, and see which are, which are maybes and which aren't. Yeah, all right, we sure can. Uh, uh, yeah, would you okay. like to just whip through them and read the questions? Yep, yep. So the uh, first one is, if WAN carries less data, what about streaming video? Um, it carries less data in terms of if you use a LAN connection, you're going to get, in contemporary world, you're going to get 100 meg or gigabit at an absolute minimum. So WANs, uh, while you can provision them, and you can pay for you know up to perhaps gigabit what well, we could probably afford maybe up to gigabit services they're generally much lower speed so 20 or 30 meg uh, however um, video streaming services ip telephony services uh, video conferencing services are designed specifically to be able to cope with that and there are certain technologies which we'll see when we get into the next few slides when technologies that allow that uh, accelerated um, performance over lower speed links for those types of um, communication protocols. Can you have broadcast traffic over a WAN? Uh, there are routers. Routers are required to route across a WAN. So no, broadcast traffic will not propagate in general across a WAN. There is an exception to that, which is related to MPLS. But again, we don't cover that too much in this particular um, short course. So in general, no, no broadcasting over WANs. Uh, what if due to some reason the switch stopped transmitting date to the equipment connected in this star connection? I'm not quite sure what that one's getting at. 
Oh, so transferring data to the equipment connecting star connection. I think that's um, meant to be. If that's the case, you'll have issues. Topology um, won't won't get around any sort of switch failure. So uh, if you've got a mesh topology, can potentially get around some sorts of switch failures, but not all. So if you have equipment failure, you're generally in a little bit of world of hurt, regardless of the type of topology you've got. Uh, what would what where would the wireless part be in that topology on router or switch? <laughs> That's a depends question. Um, uh, generally, uh, wireless connectivity will be provided by separate infrastructure. So a separate controller and separate uh, wireless access point. So not necessarily integrated on a router or a switch. Um, wireless technology that's integrated on a switch will generally be in a core part of your network, um, right in the center and generally located at each individual site rather than across the wide area network. Uh, IWAN, how does that fit into the network topology? It doesn't into these particular network topologies, so that's a different thing altogether and not something that we're going to spend a lot of time on in this, in this particular short course as network fundamentals. Uh, WAN diagram, I think a firewall is missing. Um, yeah, there are no firewalls on here um, because we're talking about a fully private uh, uh, wide area network. So in most cases, you're not, you might not need, you, uh, firewalls across those links. Um, firewalls are generally put in where you've got an internet connection or where you're trying to separate some uh, external extranet partner. Uh, in this case, you, certainly you can have firewalls over your, WAN, over your WANs, but generally they will exist at each individual site and termination would be done uh, separate uh, to the actual routing. Uh, SD WANs work to compare to managed by an, uh, SD WANs work compared to WANs managed by an ISP. What are the benefits and detriments? Um, that's probably a forum question. Best director of the forums. Um, there, there's quite a lot involved with that. So I'd say, Jay, if you could direct that to the forums, um, we can have a discussion about it there. And I can find some, I'm, I can find some resources to put up about that. But that's that's a bit outside um, scope for uh, network fundamentals. Uh, so in the star topology, does the central medicine offer, uh, does the central medicine is different capability than the others and how is it different? Um, it, it's how it's different is going to depend on what resources you have located at that particular site. Um, so in that particular case in the star topology, all we're assuming, and it's just a simple diagram, all we're assuming with a star topology is that the site that is at the center of that star is where most of the resources are. So most of the servers, most of the information, most of the users and the other satellite sites come into that central location to get their main information. So email, file and print, uh, internet access potentially, uh, all that sort of basic sort of stuff. So. Um, it's different in terms of uh, the number of resources, the infrastructure and the number of users there in general. Okay, you might be surprised that we're not talking about MPLS. Um, it, is a natural, it is a natural progression, correct, but it's, outside, it's uh, outside the scope of network fundamentals and this is a fundamentals course. So that's why we're not looking at um, MPLS specifically in any detail. We will briefly mention it once we get to routing and that as well because, and, some, and uh, VLANs because there's some association there, but not a, a question that will, uh, not a, t a technology we'll talk a lot about. Wouldn't most home routers be layer four to accommodate TCP IP? Um, no, routers are layer three. Um, layer four, they still, yes, TCP and UDP are layer four, um, but routers, routers in terms of what they specifically do, operate at layer three of the OSI model. So all they really do is determine which best, best path to take for specific traffic. Okay, the TCP, UDP, and then the other layers of the OSI model are handled by other technologies or other solutions above the pure routing part of it. And just quickly, last question I'll answer, uh, can errors be detected? Uh, depends, depends on the technology that you're using. And we'll have a look at some of those now. Okay, so if we move on to the next part, uh, where we're actually talking a little bit about the particular technologies that we use at layer one and layer two to transmit the data over the WAN. So this is how we think of this as, uh, these are the technologies, how we actually connect our WAN sites together. So the first three that we're going to briefly look at are PSTN, so standard telephone lines. 
um, X25, which is an old, older legacy type technology and frame relay, which you will see some of that still around. Some of you will still see some of that around, um, was a very popular uh, WAN technology um, over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, but they are all older style services compared to some of the technology we've got nowadays. So it's PSTN, public switch telephone network. So just your plain old telephone. Okay, so generally dial up connections. Um, or of course, DSL will also run over PSTN services, but that is a different layer two. So same layer one, it's got the same cabling, but different layer two. So it's a different technology again, and we'll look at that in a minute. X25 was a ITU standard. It was analog, it was packet switching, it was designed for very long distances. So intercontinental um, or uh, global distances. The original standard for X25 came out in the 70s and was uh, the idea was mainly to communicate between mainframe computers uh, at a centralized location and remote uh, heads, if you like. Um, 64K of throughput was generally what it started out at. So you can see really, really low speed certainly wouldn't um, be useful in today's contemporary world. It was updated in 1992 to get to two meg of throughput. Okay, so again, probably still a little bit low speed in terms of today for a WAN link, but depending on the size of your satellite site, uh, but useful at that particular time. 1992, I mean, it's a long time ago now, 26 years ago. Two meg was a lot of capacity back then, not so much now. Uh, and that was upgraded to account for this client server technology being used over wide area networks that were starting to become more prevalent at the time. We have Frame Relay, which is basically updated X25. So it's not analog anymore, it's digital. So it now uses digital switching. It's a packet switch technology and we'll see a little bit of what that's about in the next few slides. And the protocols uh, associated with Frame Relay operate at that data link layer, so layer two. It supports multiple network and transport layer protocols as well. So it'll uh, not only support uh, IP, but it'll also support IPX and Apple Talk. It would also support those in the old days, obviously not so much of that now. It'll also support IPv6. Uh, and then depending on which network layer protocol you'll have, you'll also have transport layer protocol differences as well. Uh, both X25 and Frame Relay provide uh, error checking. So in Frame Relay, there's no reliable data delivery guarantee, but there is a form of error checking. And in X25, the errors are fixed or they're retransmitted. Okay, so at that lower speed, it's not such a hit to performance, whereas at higher speed links, um, having to do those retransmissions can be a bit of a, a bit of a hit. So in terms of throughput, X25 uh, scales from, uh, well, X25, uh, 64K up to 45 meg eventually with um, more modern standards. Frame Relay is really a customer choice. So that customer choice is going to come down to, um, going to come down to how much you're willing to pay your service provider um, to provide you with the type of service guarantee that you're going to provide. Both, the, both X25 and Frame Relay use virtual circuits, that is the node connections with, um, they connect nodes with disparate physical links. So in other words, it doesn't matter what the physical connection type is, at each end, they can connect to each other. Uh, and each site will appear logically connected directly to each other. So you won't see, what that means is you basically won't see what the what's inside that provider cloud. And I'll explain that more when we get to the next slide. The advantage of this is that it's good efficient use of bandwidth because we haven't got these extra physical, um, uh, extra logical hops. Both X25 and Frame Relay are configurable as two different types of circuit types. So there's switched virtual circuits where basically the connection is established and built in order for a transmission to occur. And then when the transmission is finished, so when you finish sending your packets, um, the virtual circuit is then terminated. So it doesn't stay up all the time. Okay, the, the actual physical connection is always there, but the circuit only comes up on an on-demand type basis. With a permanent virtual circuit, it's, it's nailed up. 
it's up all the time. It's built, it's engineered that way. So it stays up all the time and that circuit is always used. So if we look at a diagram of um, these types of technologies, so frame relay and X25 on this network, uh, on this diagram are basically interchangeable. So you could have either technology in this cloud. Inside that cloud, there's a whole bucket load of service provider devices, so switches and routers that build this net, that the network is engineered and built on. However, um, these guys here, the different sites don't see, or the different businesses that connect to that network don't see that provider cloud. All they see is each other directly connected to each other. Okay, so it, it, it's, it hides a lot of that complexity um, inside the uh, network provider cloud. Again, all the same topologies are available if you wanted to, and um, they're typically not used nowadays. Most, most topologies are either mesh, if you're talking about MPLS or star, if you're talking about frame relay mainly, um, but all the topologies are on the table. Okay, I'll just uh, answer a couple of questions here. Um, just because I saw them pop up and I think they're important. There was one that uh, said earlier, there was a comment said earlier about these being old technologies. Yeah, they are. I, I pointed that out at the start that this is a, you know, this is intro just looking at where we've come from and now sort of where we're heading off. But we're certainly not going to look at all the available WAN technologies because there's a lot of them. Um, and we've only got a short period of time to cover all the, to cover these types of topologies, uh, types of technologies. So we're not going to look at them all. Okay, so DSL, next one, uh, operates over the PSTN. So that layer one is still the same. There's still physical um, cable, uh, um, public switch telephone network cables. But the next layer up, layer two is then different. Um, it requires repeaters for long distances. So what that basically means is over distance as the signal from DSL propagates across a cable, eventually gets to a certain distance and it degrades. Okay, for a number of technical reasons that we're uh, outside the scope of basic fundamental networking. But these signals basically degrade over, over distance. And so we need to repeat and regenerate that signal in order for it to cover long distances. Um, the state best suited for WAN local loop. What that basically means is it's best suited for small sites or sites to connect into a larger WAN, okay? It's not necessarily suitable for a, a WAN transmission from end to end, but it's suitable for connecting sites to the WAN cloud. What happens inside the WAN cloud is not going to be DSL, that's going to be using other technologies, but DSL is a useful technology to connect locally from your site into the WAN. Um, we know that uh, DSL supports multiple data and voice channels over a single line. So we can have data and voice over the same physical line. Um, and the, the DSL itself is at a higher, higher frequency um, and it's inaudible to humans. Okay, so that's why we can do that. We need different um, little bits and pieces. So our splitters in order to separate those signals so we don't get that, that crackling noise in the background, but they can be using, the, they can use the same, um, the same physical infrastructure. And it uses some advanced data modulation techniques. So that is how it gets data onto the actual line. Um, there's some com significant complexities in that. Uh, the actual signal alters the carrier, the data signal. So the data you're trying to transmit will change the carrier signal properties. And the two key terms to do with this is the amplitude or phase. So in other words, how, if you think about a, um, a sine wave, the amplitude is how high it gets, the phase is how long it gets. But again, that's a little bit, that's probably a little bit too much for basic uh, networking. There are a number of different types of DSL. So you'll often see it written as XDSL because there are a number of different types. So there's ADSL, a thing called GLOT, HDSL, SDSL, VDSL, SHDSL, which all stand for something slightly different. So we've got uh, asymmetric is the one most uh, most of you will know. So that's a consumer grade one. So asymmetric simply means that it'll um, download in our context, it, it transmits faster one way than the other. So in our case, it will download quicker than it will upload. Uh, SD, SDSL is, synchro, is um, 
symmetrical, so it does both directions at the same speed. High speed, very high speed. Um, so there's a number of different variants and we'll have a look at the differences in the next summary slide, which is the next slide. So the two main categories that I said are asymmetrical and, and symmetrical. Um, and the two other things to take into consideration is the terms downstream and upstream. So downstream means data traveling from the carrier switching facility towards the customer. Okay, so going to the customer. So from the WAN cloud out to the customer, that's downstream, whereas upstream is going from the customer back into the WAN cloud. So if you're thinking, sitting at home on your DSL connection now listening to this, downstream is the download that you're taking, upstream is the upload as you're requesting information from the internet in this case. Here's a quick summary slide, which is, I won't go through in any detail because um, there's no real need to, but you can sort of use this as a resource to uh, see the, dis the differences in terms of the maximum upstream and downstream throughput and the distance limitation. So this is why we need repeaters with our DSL um, technology. Okay, because there's distance, and again, it's in feet, which I apologize, so that's obviously an Americanized slide. Um, so there's distances in feet, and you'll notice, um, hopefully you'll notice that uh, with some of them as the, in general, if we take SHDSL out of the equation, um, if we look at as the speed increases, particularly here, so megabit, the downstream speed, you can see this is quite high speed, uh, the distance limitation in, so the limitation increases. So the distance it's able to transmit across gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And that's true for most WAN technologies. The faster speed, the, the higher requirement there is for um, also lower latency, lower noise. And that generally means that the cabling needs to get shorter and shorter and shorter. And there needs to be some methodology for repeating or regenerating that signal as it goes between um, different systems or, or different hops. We then have our broadband cable, so our cable networks. Um, this has been around for yeah, quite a while as well and very big in, um, has been really big in the States in the past, particularly and in Europe, give you a really high speed downstream and relatively high speed upstream really when you consider what we get here in Australia with um, DSL home services, uh, not talking about NBN at this stage, which um, it's a bit of a moot point whether that's an improvement or not. Depends on where you live really. Uh, in terms of real transmission, 10 meg downstream, 2 meg upstream is pretty typical. Uh, the transmission is limited in that it's throttled. Um, so it's restricted by uh, in the cloud and there's shared physical connections. And what that basically means is it's, it's more or less, it's and similar to DSL, it's a contention based service. So the more people you have accessing it, the slower it will be. It will be. It's, um, there's shared bandwidth, shared infrastructure. So the more people you've got on, the faster they're, the, the more they're trying to drive the system, the slower it's going to be. Um, best uses for web surfing or just basic da data download, but um, often just uh, used for uh, satellite sites, uh, or home offices. So that's just an example of a cable modem there. Uh, nothing particularly interesting about it. Uh, it looks uh, yeah, not much different from a DSL modem or any other sort of home, home brand or Soho brand modem that you might have. And it's basically responsible for bringing the signals in and doing that, uh, that uh, conversion between the LAN side of the network and, and obviously the cable broadband side. So the next one is ATM, so asynchronous transfer mode. So this is probably, this is one of the more common ones even now still, um, quite fast, but there's a, a couple of little, there's some differences about ATM. And this is one of those technologies that um, was brought about in some ways, in some part because of that requirement for a streaming video and streaming voice. So again, it's a layer two, oops, sorry, it's a, going the wrong way. It's a layer two communications method. It's a synchronous communications method. Um, nodes don't have to conform to predetermined schemes. Uh, each character is transmitted surrounded by start and stop bits. So there's a little bit of detail, which probably don't need to go into much more detail than that. Um, a big part of ATM is, is how it specifies how layer two actually frames information as it goes out a link. 
one of the interesting things about ATM is that it has a fixed packet size. So the packet or a cell as it's called in ATM is only 48 data bytes long. So it's only 48 bytes long. Now compare that to an ethernet frame, which is 1,514 and some other WAN technologies, which such as frame relay and some of the older ones, which can take up to 1500 bytes if engineered correctly. ATM is 48 bytes, so it's quite small. So 48 bytes of data plus a five byte header, so 53 bytes in all. So very small, but it has the advantage that, um, the, the uh, disadvantage is that the smaller packet size requires more overhead because for every 48 bytes you're sending, you need five bytes of overhead. And you're not going to get that with larger packets. So an ethernet frame, for example, you have 1500 bytes of data payload, 15, 14 bytes of extra stuff around it, which manages it. So the, the, that overhead is quite um, small compared to ATM. The thing about it is, is cell efficiency compensates for that loss. So the ability for them to be um, transmitted incredibly quickly offsets that loss of the extra overhead. Uh, ATM is similar in, um, similar in some ways to frame relay in that it relies on these virtual circuits. It is considered a packet switching technology. In other words, it, it will switch packet by packet through the circuits that are built. Um, but the, the fact that those virtual circuits are generally permanent and built and uh, nailed up provides that circuit sw switching advantage of a set path through the network from end to end with in conjunction with that packet switching ability to send packets individually at high speed. Generally, ATM is a very reliable type technology um, provided with um, very good uh, service level agreements. It's also, it also allows quality of service guarantee um, across the WAN. So this is really important for your time sensitive applications like your video and your voice uh, and your streaming. Uh, so it takes, it, 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 you can set up quality of service parameters, which will then be uh, acknowledged and adhered to as you go across your ATM network. Not all WAN technologies provide that um, ability. ATM is generally available in speeds from 25 meg up to around about 620 meg. It will vary depending on which country you're in um, and uh, depending on your service provider and the core uh, architecture that they've got built. There's a quick reference guide for you in terms of technology. Now you'll notice there's some other ones here on that we haven't uh, spoken about in any detail. As I said, there are a lot of different um, WAN technologies. We've spoken about some of the earlier ones to give you a, okay, this is where we've come from, where we're going. Some of the more modern ones like the ATM and, uh, and DSL, but there are other ones as well. So I think someone's mentioned uh, ISDN. Uh, that's certainly available now, not so much used in data anymore. That's um, once it got a bit, particularly in Australia, once it got a bit old for data, it was shifted into that telephone space. Uh, there's some American specific ones here, so T3 and T1, which are really just um, ISDN services, but uh, at different speeds. Uh, uh, BPL, which I'm not going to talk about, and Sonnet, which is uh, an optical network. Um, big in the States, not, not quite so big over here, but it is uh, certainly available. So that's a useful summary slide to give you ideas on the types of media, so whether it's copper or optical or microwave, how it's actually, or coax fiber in this case, and uh, the theoretical speed limits available for each of those. So next section is virtualization. So before I get onto that, I might just pop through and answer some of um, the questions there. Uh, where does NBN fit in, WAN layer two? Uh, that's a bit of a depends question, depends on the type of service you're getting, but generally, yes, it's a layer, it's a layer two differentiation. Is there any limitation as well to the use uh, number of repeaters? Uh, that will depend on the actual technology, um, uh, but with DSL uh, for the purposes of how far DSL goes, generally no, there's no limit on that. Uh, is ISDN transmitted via frame or X25? No, it's a separate architecture, it's a separate technology altogether, so it, it's got its own transmission properties. Limitation pertaining to different problems that may occur. I'm not sure what that question is asking, sorry. Um, VCI and VPI in ADSL. So that's virtual circuit, um, virtual path. Uh, they're similar to um, the virtual circuit technology we've talked about in 
uh, X25. So they're basically identifiers which um, identify to the service provider equipment which circuit you are specifically connected to. So it's your path on your ADSL platform through the network. What type of WAN technology is NBN fibre to the node, fibre to the premise? Um, fibre to the node, fibre to the premise is really layer one. Um, well, it's a moot point, it's arguable. So depends on who you talk to. Some people talk to it, uh, talk it as being a layer two, but really when you think of it, fibre to the node, fibre to the premise, it's got components of both, but primarily one of those layer one things, in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. Um, depending on who you talk to, they'll give you layer two constraints around it too. Okay, so virtualization. So virtualization um, is basically, as you probably most of you will be aware, is emulation of a computer operating system environment or an application on a physical system. So um, it's multiple, it can be multiple computers, operating system environments or applications on a single system or it can just be a single, which although that seems a little bit pointless is, is often done. So a virtual machine can either be a virtual workstation, it can be virtual servers, it can be virtual firewalls, it can be virtual switches and virtual routers, it can be pretty much a virtual anything um, nowadays. And if you think about Windows Server 2016, they have that, that nano server technology, which basically allows anything, any particular applications to be virtualized and containerized. So it's pretty much unlimited now what you can um, uh, virtualize. So the virtual devices, virtual machines, whatever they are, can be configured to use different types of CPU storage um, technologies and network technologies as well. So it's basically, you, know, you have a large infrastructure platform, which has got lots of CPU, lots of, lots of memory, lots of storage capacity, lots of network connectivity. Um, and that is split up into smaller parts and shared among logical machines that exist on that particular platform. So if we look at it here, um, if you consider this computer like box to be a large system with lots of RAM, lots of processing power, lots of disk space, uh, lots of network bandwidth coming into it. There's the physical network connection to the network. There's the actual physical computer or host itself. And then inside that host, there's a device called a hypervisor, which is basically the management platform for these virtual machines. And then you've got the virtual machines which live underneath that, the control of that particular hypervisor. And they can be any operating system whatsoever. So Windows, any form of Linux, you know, OS2, if you're that way inclined, whatever you like. And they can be any types of device as well. As I said before, firewall, switch, router, whatever. In terms of virtualization, the advantages of it is that it provides an efficient use of resources. So instead of having lots of little servers, maybe not doing a whole lot, we've got one massive server with lots of virtual machines on it. And at any one time, um, you know, these machines will share processing power, they'll share disk space, they'll share memory, and that memory will be dynamically allocated backwards and forwards between machines as they require it. So if, for example, you've got uh, a, a virtual machine which isn't doing too much, it's just sitting there idly, then memory will be dynamically allocated and processing dynamically allocated away from that to other virtual machines that may require it at the time. There are cost and energy savings. Um, uh, because you've got less physical plant uh, uh, required. There's fault and threat isolation. So um, as things go wrong with particular virtual machines, they can be easily um, turned off or replaced or um, rebuilt really quickly. And really, really simple backup recovery and replication. So um, because it all just exists virtually in software. So there's some great, and with that, you know, we're not doing a, a course on virtualization. So there's no huge need to talk too much about it, but there's lots of virtualization platforms where you can create a virtual machine. Um, if something goes wrong with it, you just simply, you know, um, you take a backup of it and then you simply pop it up again and away it goes. Uh, you can move it from one hardware platform to another if there's issues with your hardware platform. Lots of flexibility in virtualization. However, there is disadvantages. One of them potentially being comp compromised performance if your underlying superstructure doesn't have 
the right amount of processing power or memory or disk space or network access in order to meet the requirements of all the virtual machines that you have on it. So there's always going to be a limit to how many virtual machines, how far you can scale your technology. Uh, clearly there's some sort of increased complexity because no longer do we have a simple, simple device with a single operating system that we can manage and we can all get our head around. All of a sudden now we have a large piece of kit which has got lots of operating system, lots of machines running on it and there's a lot of complexity that goes into that. Uh, there's not necessarily, I would beg to differ a little bit with this point in that so there's not necessarily increased licensing costs but there are different licensing costs and potentially um, more depending on uh, how many machines are going to um, pop out. A uh, single point of failure, I'd also maybe argue a little bit about that now um, with the uh, platforms, um, particularly with things like Cisco's UCS or you know, high speed um, chassis based machines, which can have lots of redundancy built in at the actual hardware level, um, not just at that software level. So uh, those last two points are a little bit debatable uh, in my opinion. In terms of actually linking that back to network components, um, we can have virtual networks, uh, which is in this case, not the same as a VLAN, um, and which can be created to consist completely of virtual machines on a physical server. Okay, so a if you think of a virtual network as just uh, being that virtual platform, network platform that connects the virtual machines on a physical server. Okay, so it lives inside memory on that server and connects all of those servers together. So if they need to talk to each other, they don't then go outside that physical server, they stay within that physical server. And in most cases, the network combination in a virtualized platform will be both physical and virtual. So there'll be that virtual uh, connections between the servers on that same host, and, and then there will be the physical connection out to other resources in your network. The virtual switches and bridges, basically they're pretty simple devices really. Um, a virtual bridge or switch is simply created when the first virtual machine's network interface card, the, so the logical network interface card is, is selected and enabled in your virtual machine. Once that's done, the virtual bridge or switch, terms are interchangeable, is then um, are created and it's there for everyone to use. Uh, so it then connects the virtual machine back to the physical host and it just lives in RAM. It's just a logical virtual construct. The virtual switch uh, again is then logically, is a logically defined device. So it's a, de it's a device that the administrator on the virtualized platform will create. So it's no different to a Cisco switch or any other vendors physical switch. It's just created inside the memory of the actual host itself. And again, it operates at the data link layer, so exactly the same as a normal switch, and it passes frames back and forwards between the virtual machines and anything that's off that server host. So it's no different to a, a real switch, a physical switch, it just lives in memory. The virtual bridge, um, so the differentiation from a virtual point of view is that the virtual bridge will also connect to the virtual NICs, so the virtual interfaces on the virtual machines to the physical network. So if we look at that, probably easy to look at it here. So we've got virtual machine one, two, three, and four. Each of them has a virtual network interface card, which connects, which is bridged to the virtual switch. And then the virtual switch will connect to the physical network interface cards on the server and off to the physical network. So, so the physical network will most likely be uh, a physical switch on the other side of that. So we have physical switch going through physical network cards to a virtual switch to the virtual network cards. So it's all um, related to the time. And just a quick question, virtual bridge or switch resides in RAM, won't it get lost if the power is switched off? Yes, it will, but the configuration is safe. So when the machine comes back up again, it's reconfigured, it's all there to go. So it runs in, in memory, obviously, to make it faster. So it goes flat stick, but uh, yeah, it will go. Yeah, absolutely. If you turn the machine off, well, there's no need for it anyway. Um, okay, and there's just a, another logical example of it. So we've got a couple of hosts here, host A and host B, as opposed to host A and host B. Um, we have our virtual switches in here. So switch A and switch B with our virtual NICs and our virtual machines. And then we've got our physical network interface cards. In this case, it's connected to a router. Um, 
probably more likely to be a switch in an enterprise environment, but it could be a router in a smaller environment, sure. It depends. Virtual appliances, lots of them. Um, they're a good alternative to test servers for new, so to, for new software. So running up a virtual machine is a really good thing to use if you want to test something. Um, virtual appliances could include anything. So they could be operating systems, they could run software, they can have their own specific hardware specifications and application configuration as well. Most of the time they're configured as virtual servers, but you can have other functions enabled as well. So you can make a virtual firewall, which some may argue with a server, but with the virtualized firewall systems, they're, they're standalone. You can have email solutions, network management, remote access. And as I said before, you can, you can run virtualized routing and switching platforms on those as well. So in virtual routing and switching from a, uh, a Cisco type perspective, so a bigger picture switching and routing perspective, rather than just talking about that virtual switch, which merely connects the virtual machines uh, to the uh, physical host. So it's a little bit different as well. Bigger picture. So there's lots of uses for them. So uh, in terms of remote virtual computing, the whole idea about this is that it allows workstations to remotely access and control other workstations. Um, so hosts may allow clients any sort of all sorts of different privileges. So you may just be able to connect to a remote um, workstation or a remote server and perform specific operations, so specific tasks related to your day to day work, or you may be able to administer the system which you're connecting to. Um, the whole idea is that you basically use a really low powered device or a specific um, remote device that will just connect to that remote server and you download or basically get you know the operating system and everything for that your device that you're connecting from is all run on that on that virtual platform so you connect to it remotely so you end up with this little really el cheapo device that you can put on users desktops and they connect to a high powered remote server which provides them with all that um, remote connectivity and remote application service um, and the keystrokes and mouse clicks are simply sent across the network to that uh, powerful host and then that interprets them and, and, and sends back that feedback based on what you're trying to do on your keyboard and mouse. So again, that thin, that thin client. Okay, so thin client simply means that it's a client that doesn't really have an operating system, it just connects remotely. Whereas a thick client is something like a desktop or a laptop that has its own operating system and just connects to get resources off that um, remote system. And that's just a, just a quick example. Um, so mapping up remote access software, something like RDP, so Remote Desktop Protocol, which many of you will have used through Windows, uh, which lives at the application layer of the OSI model. And it simply flows down the stack. In this case, we're using an ethernet connection to log into a remote server and away we go. So that's just an example of what it looks like from a OSI model perspective. Some of the advantages of this remote VC is that it's nice and simple to configure and it runs over any connection type. So it can be a WAN connection, it can be a LAN connection, any sort of technology um, will run virtual computing. Now, obviously, depending on what performance requirements you have, uh, there may be uh, certain platforms or certain uh, technologies that are better than others, but it will run over any connection type. Uh, and of course, a, a single host or a single powerful computer, the backend server will accept simultaneous connections from multiple clients. So it's no point if we could only do a one, one to one relationship. It's obviously a one to many relationship. And some of the more popular programs that are used for this particular purpose, uh, uh, so it's Microsoft Remote Desktop, so it's RDP, uh, VNC, Virtual Network Computing, which is a really common one, particularly for management, and uh, Independent Computing Architecture or ICA. So just quickly, remote desktop comes with Windows client server operating systems. VNC is an open source piece of software that you can uh, pull down and install on your systems to be able to use. There's also a thing called tight VNC, which is also uses encryption. Um, so it's a protected communication stream. stream. And then we've got ICA, uh, which can vir virtually work with any operating system or application and really, really easy to use, but it's a, it's a Citrix um, specific uh, architecture in that case. But just examples of remote desktop programs. Uh, and just have a look at 
There's a couple of questions. Uh, okay, I'll answer them now. So if malware affected a virtual machine, will that spread through to other VMs as well as a physical server? Uh, generally won't spread to the physical server. That's a separate ad abstraction. Um, so it's a layer away. So it's very unlikely to spread to the physical server. It is possible that it may spread to the other virtual uh, machines. Um, that's going to depend on um, the uh, security solution that you have deployed. So my advice is obviously to have a security solution. So a malware and antivirus platform, uh, clearly. Uh, how many virtual switches can be linked to a physical NIC? Um, a bit dependent on the vendor, uh, but some of them can have multiple. Some of them um, will only support one. So it depends on licensing and also which vendor. So VMware, Microsoft, you know, other vendors, uh, depending on which vendor you're using and um, your licensing for that. So VPNs, okay, which is virtual private networking. So uh, most of you will have used these at some stage or another, I would think, uh, even if it's just to access your home office, uh, so your office from home. Um, so there are generally two types of technologies used for this is IPsec, which is a built encrypted tunnel, um, or there's SSL based VPNs, which are basically using HTTPS or SSL around a web browser. Okay, so they're the two basic ways you can do it. There are others, but they're the two main ways that most VPNs are built. The basic idea of a VPN is that it's a logically defined network that uses a public transmission media. So what that means is we basically use the internet. We use a public network and we build an encrypted tunnel over that network over which we send our uh, own private data. It requires really, really inexpensive software. For the main part, there are some systems that are quite expensive to build a VPN with, but you can build really inexpensive VPNs um, using just public domain software, really. Uh, so running VPN technology between a couple of houses or a couple of small businesses just using DSL uh, internet connections. The important considerations are interoperability. So that means that you know not all VPN clients will talk to all other VPN clients. So you've, you've really got to have a single, plat a single um, VPN architecture or a VPN software across all of your sites that you want to connect via your VPN. They don't generally play too well with each other, very proprietary in the main. And the other one is a different level of security. So some VPN software, or some VPN products will have a really high level security, others won't. And there are two main types of VPNs in terms of topology. There's a site to site VPN and there's a client to site VPN or a remote access VPN. That's also another term for client to site. So site to site is basically a VPN that is built as a WAN and used as a WAN between building sites. Um, whereas a remote access or client site VPN is one where say a road warrior might be an insurance salesman might be having it taking their laptop to a hotel and then dialing in over a VPN connection to the public network. So see here a site to site VPN, you've got the internet here in the center. So I'll just turn that laser pointer on. Internet here in the center over which all these VPN circuits are built. And that creates a WAN of a sort, an encrypted WAN but it uses internet connections. So the advantage of that is generally internet connections are much cheaper than a private WAN connection that's, that's built using ATM or frame relay or some other such technology. Um, remote access VPN or client to site. Here's an example of here. So we have, uh, we could have a small remote office. Let's turn it on again. So we have a small remote office using a DSL connection. We have mobile phones or mobile devices. Uh, we have a small office here, or we have a home office that are connecting to each other using virtual circuits over a public infrastructure. Okay, so the internet in the vast majority of cases. You can also run VPN technology over a, a private WAN as well in order to build a, a secure connection over that private WAN. So to keep your traffic in your department potentially uh, separate from every other department as an example. So then there's the, the, the enterprise-wide VPN um, can include elements of remote access and site to site. So you can have both existing at the same time. You don't have to, there's not one or the other, you can have both. Um, and which VPN technology you'll use will be tailored to the customer's distance. 
the requirements of the users, so what sort of applications they're going to use and how much bandwidth they'll have at their disposal. So say for instance, if um, we've got an insurance salesman and all he needs is access to uh, an intranet site um, at his home base, then an SSL VPN which runs over a web browser might be fine. But if he needs to connect to the head office to use a database server and, and to um, do file and print type, um, operations, then an IP, IPsec technology is probably going to be a better use because the SSL based variety doesn't traditionally have all the full features that a IPsec connection will have. An IPsec based VPN is basically like being in the office itself. You're permanently connected and it's just like you see the, the resources like you're actually in the office. Whereas an SSL based portal will give you a access to a web browser or some other client that's not exactly like um, what it's like being in the office and doesn't provide you with that same, uh, same level of need. And just briefly, a couple of major points of uh, types of tunneling protocols, uh, which I think I think there's some resources about, and there might be a little task for you to do in this week. Point-to-point uh, -point tunneling protocol, layer two tunneling protocol. LT2P uh, is a little less secure than PPTP, um, and they're they're used in specific circumstances. These are, these are both sort of really Microsoft heavy centric type um, protocols. Um, and in general, uh, better off using an IPsec type uh, deployment than you would either one of those. But they're just a couple of examples of tunneling protocols. And with that, I promised we'd be done under the 90 minutes. Um, that's it. So uh, I see we've got some questions that are open there. Um, yeah. Uh, I think I think Steve's might actually be a follow-up question from Saru's earlier uh, about malware affecting a virtual machine that will spread through to other virtual machines. Um, would that would that make sense? Um, it can again also go further into uh, encrypted backup systems. Uh, yep, I'll just answer in a sec. I think I've just lost the screen there for a second, so let me just get that back. Yep. All right, sorry about that, guys. Okay, so uh, okay, so Steve, as well as encrypted backup systems to allow rollback for when crypto attacks. So sorry, what what do you think that's in reference to, Guy? I missed that one. Just from the timing, I think it might be a follow up to Saru's question um, about malware affecting a virtual machine and spreading through. Um, Steve, if, I, if I've got that wrong, um, you might be able to send me back and, and maybe. Uh, okay, all right. Well, we might clarify that one before I answer that. Um, yeah. Oh, no. Steve's come through and said, yeah, that's right. Uh, well, in the event of malware getting into a virtual machine, can it also get into encrypted backup systems? Uh, potentially, yes. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's potentially, yeah, potentially, yes, absolutely. Um, it's going to depend, again, on, on the, the type of security that you've got around it and how isolated you keep those virtual machines. Because remember, even though the virtual machines may exist on a single host, they can still be separated by the same sort of network um, technologies that we sort of briefly talked about last week in terms of routers and subnets. So you can still split them. They can even be, even though they're virtual machines that exist on the same physical host, they can also be separated by firewalls. So um, there's not always the case that these sorts of things will propagate, but there's always a possibility that they can, absolutely. Uh, does SSL is a secured as site-to-site -site VPN. Um, ooh. Y yes, and uh, well, there are some well-known security flaws around SSL and around web browsers. So from that point of view, there is a potential that SSL is not quite as secure as, and I think what we're really talking about here is IPsec, uh, because SSL is a site-to-site, -site, um, oh, sorry. No, I mis misinterpreted the question. Sorry, I think what you're saying is SSL is secure site-to-site -site VPN. Um, I would say no to that because, again, SSL is used for that remote access, um, that remote access VPN. Uh, it, it's built around a web browser, around the HTTPS protocol, um, whereas those site-to-site -site VPNs are nailed up using IPsec technology. If the IPsec technology that you use and the encryption algorithms you use are the best that are currently available, then the site-to-site -site VPN will be, uh, in theory, more secure than the SSL, simply because there are less moving parts, if that makes sense. 
Uh, so is Tor a VPN um, of a sort? Yes. I don't know that I want to talk too much about Tor given it's uh, links to the uh, dark web, but um, yes, it is a VPN of sort. Yep. Uh, is FedGov icon basically a limited VPN? Um, I'm not really sure. I don't have uh, much information on FedGov icon to be able to give you a uh, qualified answer on that one. Might be something for the forum there. Um, yeah, Michael, it might be a good one to ask because I'm, I'm sure there's probably someone out there that will know the answer to that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I, I can't give you a qualified answer on that. I'm sorry. Anything I'd say would just be sort of guessing um, based on the very little I know about it. Uh, PPTP less secure than L2TP. Um, that's a debate uh, that has been raising for quite some time, but uh, generally it's often thought that it's actually the other way around. L2TP is less secure than PPTP. But again, it depends on uh, the implementation. Um, so basically the underlying operating system that you're running on and how you set it up. And, and Williams uh, just added that no icon is more like a private WAN in the chat. Oh, okay. There you go. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Icon provides dark fiber links that are an unmetered and cost-effective telecommunication service to Australian government entities across the ACT. Oh, yeah. beautiful. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. This is why I like the chat. That, uh, along with all of the zingers that have been in there tonight. It's been a cracker tonight, Matt. <laughs> oh, has it? Oh, I haven't. Well, I deliberately don't look at the chat because I, I find that just distracts me. And uh, keeps me off target. So, um, and uh, I promised I'd be under 90 minutes tonight. So, I had to make sure that I kept on target. I very much appreciated your Jose one, Jose two as well. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, I wonder whether anyone would pick that one up. All right, a uh, couple of quick questions, and then, and then, other than that, thanks very much for everyone to, for coming along. Um, and thanks to you, Matt and Chantel, as well. I'll, I'll let you answer those last questions, Matt, and then sign off. But other than that, um, hope you're enjoying the forums. Um, and yeah, keep coming. Okay, so Icon, oh, so it's a statement. Icon is dark fiber, not a VPN. So thank you, David. Um, if your company has a VPN and you use your own VPN on top, might that create a DNS leakage? Uh, it, it, it shouldn't if you are using current VPN technologies, no, um, because they, they keep those all that sort of thing very, very separate. Um, there are potentials for that to happen. Um, again, you can misconfigure things and that can occur, yeah, but uh, generally that's protected against now. So, all right, last question for the evening. So thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your attendance. Um, again, next week, what are we talking about next week, Guy? <laughs> I haven't got it in front of me, unfortunately. <laughs> no worries. Uh, oh, bugger me, neither have I. Um, well, a reminder is someone's looking it up. Uh, someone will chuck it in the chat, no doubt, because they're faster than us. Uh, next, yeah, probably got open, yeah. the, the recording will be up tomorrow. Um, and if you do have any problems, feel free to, to email in. Uh, and no one sent it in. Oh, well, stay tuned. Ne network operations. Thanks very much, Steve. Oh, uh, network operations. Okay. So, yeah, okay. So, next week, um, yeah, so we'll be just over the hour, but inside the 90 minutes again. Next week, guaranteed, I promise everyone. So, uh, thank you very much, everyone. And thank you to Guy and Chantel again for your um, expert knowledge and assistance in, in getting this up and running nice and smoothly. So, thanks very much. <laughs>